Jesus spoke, entreating them to live together in a great circle of love. And when his followers asked him then who should be included, Jesus said, let everybody in, everybody in, everybody in to the circle, sir. Everybody, 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 everybody and to the circle, circle. Oligarchs and tyrants try to keep some in and everyone else outside till revolution sweeps across the land and, and the people all stand and the comic folk cry that everybody and everybody and everybody and Circle, circle, everybody, 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 everybody and to the circle, cir circle. Sometimes a circle is a class or creed. Sometimes a circle is made of only men. Until Susan B. Anthony says, What about me? Let me in, let everybody in. Everybody, everybody, everybody into the circle, circle. Everybody, 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 everybody into the circle, circle. Sometimes a circle is a privileged thing, excluding people for the color of their skin. Until the voice of Martin Luther King says, "Let freedom ring." Everybody, everybody, everybody into the circle, circle. Everybody, 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 everybody into the circle, circle. Gay and straight, rich and poor, whole and broken, open up that door. The more we are, the greater we become. After all, we all, we all are one Bring in the people But don't stop there Bring in the fish in the sea And the birds in the air Bring in the rivers wide And the mountains tall We go together Not at all Let everybody 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 Into the circle Circle Everybody Everybody Everybody, 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 and to the circle, circle, everybody, everybody, and everybody, and to the circle, circle, everybody, 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 and to the circle, circle. Islands. Sorry, I don't know if everyone heard that. <laughs> um, there will be, um, a, we'll, so first we'll pray a breath prayer, then there will be a moment of silence. Um, I will read a verse of scripture, there will be a moment of silence, and then we're going to repeat that cycle twice. So I hope that you can use this time as a time for connection. So I invite you to join me in this breath prayer as we recognize the Creator's presence with us. The breath prayer that we'll start with is, be still and know that I am God. And just a quick refresher on breath prayers. Um, you know, the Spirit it is a great starting point between settlers and First Nations people. There's a lot of agreement around spirit, and the spirit has breathed life into us. And so as we inhale, we will say, be still and know. And then as we exhale, we say that I am God. So be still and know that I am God. Why don't we just try that together once? Be still, and it might be nice if you turned your sound on, but you don't have to. Be still and know that I am God. Okay, so that's the breath prayer that we're going to pray. And I invite you to pray that with all of us as we do that now. I, 
I will be, you will hear me the first couple times and then I'll just quietly do it on my own as well. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Ponder these words from 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19 from the message. The old life is gone. A new life emerges. Look at it. All this comes from God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. Our second prayer is from Philippians 4. It's Christ Jesus, bring peace beyond understanding. So inhale, Christ Jesus, bring peace. Exhale, beyond understanding. Ponder these words from 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19 from the First Nations Version. Through the Chosen One, Creator has removed the hostility between human beings and himself, bringing all creation into harmony once again. The Great Spirit has chosen us to represent him. In the task, in the sacred task of helping others find and walk this path of peacemaking and healing, turning enemies into friends.
we're going to close this segment with a healing prayer um, by Jonathan Miracle. I'm so glad that each of you are here today. And if we ever get a chance to meet in person or on another Zoom call, I hope you'll tell me a little about, about your family story here in Canada. Uh, I'd love to hear it. Uh, I invite Karen Turner now to walk us through the next steps. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just gonna give you a little brief little outline of what's happening today. Um, Right after, um, after I tell you what's happening, then I'm gonna introduce a film to you. Um, the film is called Doctrine of Discovery, Stolen Land, Strong, Strong Hearts. We're only gonna see a part of it. Uh, and then there'll be some, uh, the, the sec segments of the film that we've selected. And then Larry Ogden will introduce our speaker, who is Dr. Ray Aldred. Um, after Ray speaks, then we'll have a brief stretch break. And then there'll be a Q&A, which I'm going to moderate, and uh, I'll give you a little more uh, direction at that time about um, asking questions. Um, and then, as um, Blake mentioned earlier, we're going to have um, a, the annual general meeting of the Gathering of Baptists. It's going to be quite short, uh, less than half an hour. And uh, even if you're not a member of the Gathering, if you're just curious about uh, what we're all about, you're more than welcome to stay. So let me tell you about this film. Um, the Doctrine of Discovery, um, is it, the film is called Doctrine of Discovery, Stolen Lands, Strong Hearts. And it's a film about a devastating decision made over 500 years ago, which continues to profoundly impact Indigenous and settler people worldwide. Pope Alexander VI, back in the 1400s, ruled that the lands that were being discovered by European explorers at the time was empty land. 
and that its millions of indigenous inhabitants were non-human, which gave the explorers um, kind of carte blanche to take over whatever lands they discovered. Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission released its 94 calls to action in 2015, with many of them referring to the doctrine of discovery and calling for its repudiation. This film was created by um, the Anglican Church of Canada's Primates Commission on Discovery, Reconciliation and Justice. The purpose of the film is to respond to these calls to action by helping to provide education and insight into the racist foundations of many of our property and other laws still existing in existence to this day. The whole film is about an hour long, but sadly we only have time today to show you the first 20 minutes or so. The film is readily available on the Anglican Church of Canada's website, and I'm hoping that Dave will be able to put a link to it in the chat. Um, but it's very easy to Google it. Um, just the title of the film and Anglican Church of Canada gets you right there. On that same website is a study guide to the film. Should you want to explore the issues around our themes for today in your congregations? That is the doctrine of discovery, its effect on the colonization of indigenous lands, how it is embedded in our social and legal structures even today, and how it is also embedded in the structures and theology of our churches. So let's just settle back and watch the first 20 minutes of Doctrine of Discovery, Stolen Lands, Strong Hearts.
empires of England, Spain, France, and Portugal divided up the world. And they were very active in terms of exploring the world and taking our lands illegally that were already occupied by indigenous nations worldwide. So they went to the Pope of the Catholic Church to validate the illegal taking of the lands. And what did the Pope do in the 14th century? He issued a papal bull. The papal bull provided instructions that indigenous peoples are not human or Christian. Because indigenous people are not human, they don't have sovereignty in government. I remember reading it and thinking, that doesn't make sense. How can you simply take over somebody's territory by saying you no longer exist or you never existed because we didn't, didn't know about you? It wasn't until I was older and starting to, starting to educate myself on our history and what had happened and why our communities are in these states um, was, in, was when I heard the Doctrine of Discovery first time so I just remember reading it and thinking like this is this can't be real this isn't this isn't something that makes sense this is something that's like inhumane and just not not something that was fair to the people that were the protectors of this land. Another word for this is uh, terra nullius, empty land. And the land is made empty not by clearing the people out but it's made empty through law. Chief Justice John Marshall basically said, in simple terms, we are sovereign because of the doctrine of discovery. We have the right to govern this land because we discovered it. And he wasn't talking about we in the American sense, he was talking about we in the white man sense. And that therefore, those nations that were here, those Indian nations that were here, are now semi-sovereign nations. So they're no longer sovereign. They are dependent upon our sovereignty, our willingness to let them retain some elements of sovereignty. It's relevant because not only is it the, basically the root of the whole structure of property law in Canada and the United States and Australia, uh, for instance, but uh, it is thoroughly enmeshed in the structures of our law so deeply that it's often difficult to even spot it. This fiction, this hidden foundation still lives with us because we don't assume by and large that Indigenous peoples today are primitive or have lower social skills on this kind of hierarchy of civilizations. Um, but nevertheless, the law continues to assume that sovereignty of the crown is paramount, that crown title is underlying all of our land, um, when in fact that comes from nowhere. It comes from just an assertion. The underlying question is how, in the Canadian context for instance, uh, where does the crown get its right to hold underlying title for all lands, which is the way that our law is structured? Where does the crown get its jurisdiction over all matters. Um, um, and there's this sense that this came out of the ether, it was always thus. Starting at the time of the first colonial incursions into the Americas, there had to be justification. Why did the colonial powers have the right to take over these lands and assert their sovereignty or their jurisdiction? What did they do about the fact that there were people here already who were living in, using these lands, exercising their own laws, having their own political structures? There had to be some sort of justification to allow that colonial authority to be asserted. Sadness surrounds me, traveling through Aboriginal homeland see things that others can't. Longhouses, smoke bellowing from center. Surrounded by wooden palisades. Brown woman tending to three sisters, the corn, the beans, the squash. Men wandering through the bush, 
hunting for deer and other sustenance. Children running through the woods, playing games, laughing. Mohawk River flows, creator's artery, bringing fish for harvest, a waterway for travel. Can smell the sweet grass, the strawberries, the first fruits of summer. We occupied the whole Turtle Island, U.S. and Canada, North America. And uh, our nations and our people were uh, granted uh, inherent rights by the Creator. It wasn't an empty land and there were lots of uh, government sort of structures. The Mi'kmaq had different provinces. They used to come together on you know, regular meetings the Five Nations and then the Six Nations of the Iroquois Confederacy. These were people who were mostly farmers. In uh, Ontario, it's estimated that there was about 90 to 110,000 people living here when the Europeans came in. Uh, when the Jesuits, for instance, came in 1615 along with uh, Samuel de Champlain, encountered the Wendat people, the Huron. There they lived as 40,000 people between what's now Barry, Aurelia and Collingwood and they were in villages of 2,000 people, and there were 200 miles of roads that were connecting these villages. And there were trade routes everywhere. They found parrot feathers in the Arctic. You know, the trade routes were the incredible way of getting around and ensuring that people were able to survive. So if you got all of this territory in corn from the early Haudenosaunee peoples, and you've got northern hunters with moose meat and deer meat, and you know, there's gonna be trade. This area was settled because of the wealth of the, of the waters as well, not just the land. We were highly organized and structured in our governing systems. And uh, we had uh, the kinship clan systems of the various nations on Turtle Island. And uh, really uh, major functions, duties, and responsibilities of each of the clans uh, in the kinship clan system that formed the basis of how we structured our, our governing systems. The essence though of the clan system is that you respect the gifts that different people bring. And um, so some people are, are really good hunters and some people are really good cooks and some people are really good with money and some people are good intellectuals. And the essence of the clan system is you respect what each of them bring and, and collectively we, we figure it out. What I often refer to is who made the laws, who made the rules. The female side, the grandma, the moms made the rules in the family, the home, and the community. And as men, we had to enforce them. The whole concept of buying and selling land was a foreign concept to us. We didn't believe in it. We didn't believe that the land could be bought and could be sold and that we were letting people use the land and it was not a permanent transfer. It is about uh, thriving cultures with political structures, with their own legal norms, with their own systems of exercising jurisdiction, with their own property laws. Um, and many of those societies continue to today. So uh, a, a really wonderful example of that in the Canadian context right now is the archaeological discoveries that have been confirmed in the last, uh, within the last two years on the uh, uh, BC coast, so in the area of the Heltsuk First Nation. One is the excavation of a 15,000 year old village site that the Heltsuk community today knew about. So within their living memory, they knew that this was a place that their community had used 15,000 years ago and had continued to use for the past 15,000 years. But then I see blood. My ancestors covered in red, lifelessness. Settlers' blood, too. Who was right? Who was wrong? Both wanted good life, good land. Now I see farmlands. Wonder if they grow the three sisters. 
see hard pavement that was once soft trail, good to walk with deerskin moccasins. Old stone buildings and homes carved out of once pristine land now replace longhouses and a good creator-given life that was before. Over the years, 50 years now that I've been walking that way, so I've met many First Peoples, and had, and, but I've been able to develop relationships with them as people. I began to learn the facts, the truths, the history. The fact that we signed treaties, that the Indian people, as we talked about Indians, had been here for thousands of years, and we were the newcomers among them, and we were the people who came and lived within their territory, their homeland, and they accepted us as neighbors. They were willing to take us in. There's an innate respect in our people for everyone and everything because Everyone is a creation of, of the Creator, is you know, created by God. Therefore, that's an automatic respect. And so we just went along with them and helped them get along and help them survive. There's a complicated set of factors that uh, broke this relationship that was quite strong at one point. Settlers needed Indigenous peoples for knowing about the land, how to survive, food. Um, often it was just men coming along and so there was partnerships formed and the children were mixed uh, between European and Indigenous uh, parents and that you know went on for 250 years in North America and was quite strong and developed distinctive cultures in many of those places. I think what started to erode that was the development of a mercantile system that uh, could alienate or separate uh, people from one another through um, trade that uh, then had war attached to it. Canada has not got the reputation the United States has where there was a lot of, of killing and shooting and burying of bodies. You know, in Canada it was a little more subtle. These people that were here were in the way. And so how do we remove these people in a way that isn't blood letting? but it confines them someplace else. And so that was the remove people from their lands, put them in a space where we can contain them, control their access to resources. You know, with McDonald, John A. McDonald, our first prime minister, it was let's just starve them to death. Uh, if, they, if they can't eat and they can't survive, they can't make babies, they can't continue. Of course, if you want to disorient any population, the first thing you must do is somehow break their contact with the land because the land on which they live is the source of their identity, uh, their medicines, their food, their ability to self-sustain. And then that didn't work, so let's just take their children away and we'll teach their children how to do things our way. Let's help them by taking their kids from them and raising them in Western ways. And so take them in, you strip them of their clothes, you shave their hair, you douse them with lye, you put them in identical clothing, and when they try to speak their languages, you put pins through their tongues, you punish them corporally, you tell them that their parents aren't, um, and their communities aren't worthy of emulation. Can you imagine a five-year-old or a six-year-old taken from their parents, institutionalized, and then everything good about being a First Nations person is no good. Their beautiful long hair was cut. Their beautiful languages weren't allowed. Their access to their families and their ceremonies were disallowed. And everything they've known, the pride in who they were as a First Nation, is no good. Your family's no good, your community's good, your nation's, your First Nation's no good. In fact, you're no good. Then on top of that, you, you, you put on that physical abuse, then sexual abuse and mental abuse. 
you are not healthy coming out of that institution. The doctrine of discovery is something that we could say clearly was behind the residential schools because it was about Christian and European superiority and the notion of remaking Indigenous people in that image. For their benefit was the perspective, for their benefit either in this world or the next. And we know the impacts of the residential schools uh, didn't stop with the closing of the residential schools, that those impacts spilled over into generations and are causing intergenerational trauma even to this day. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. I am, um, are you hearing me all right? I can hear you. You're coming through fine, Larry. Okay, thank you. I'm pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Reverend Dr. Ray Aldred, our featured speaker for today's uh, gathering. Currently, uh, Dr. Aldred is the director of the Ind Indigenous Studies Program at the Vancouver School of Theology, whose mission it is to partner with Indigenous church around theological education. The school is an affiliated college of the University of British Columbia. Dr. Aldred also leads the teaching house that moves around, an internationally recognized initiative that addresses the need for truth and reconciliation and healing among indigenous peoples and to foster greater understanding for all societies. Dr. Aldred was first ordained with the Christian and Missionary Alliance in Canada and is now an ordained uh, minister with the Anglican Church of Canada. Under the leadership of Dr. Aldred, Vancouver School of Theology annually hosts the Indigenous Summer School that draws faculty and participants for intensive dialogue and training on current issues. Ray is Cree from Swan River Band, Tree 8, born in Northern Alberta and now residing with his wife in Richmond, British Columbia. Formerly, he served as Assistant Professor of Theology at Ambrose Seminary in Calgary. He is former Director for the First Nations Alliance Churches of Canada, a committee member who's, where he works to encourage Indigenous churches. He also has had the privilege of addressing several colleges, conferences, and meetings on Indigenous and related issues. In June 2020, upon the retirement of Dean Dutcher Wallace, Dr. Aldred was appointed interim dean of the Vancouver School of Theology for the 2020-21 academic year. He holds a Master of Divinity degree from Canadian Theological Seminary and a Doctor of Theology degree from Wick. Dr. Alden, it is my pleasure to welcome you as our guest speaker at the annual meeting of the Baptists of Gathering of Baptists. And we're all looking forward to your remarks. All right, thank you very much. I'm here uh, today, I'm in Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, Treaty One, I think. And uh, I'm doing, we're doing a teaching house that moves around today. I just finished. 15 minutes ago. <laughs> Something could be national trauma in Canada. There's seven generations of Indigenous people were impacted, went to residential schools, and then the fallout of that, you know, is uh, it's difficult. It, it, it means that lots of us have experienced trauma. And then, and it's hard to get through those things. So we're, we were talking about ways that we could begin to work through the things that have happened in the past. But I understand you want me to talk a little bit about the doctrine of discovery. So if at any point you sort of have questions 
probably easiest for me if you put them in your chat and then we at the end of my talk you can take we can take some time for questions and and uh so i think unless you guys had another plan i'm not sure who the moderator for the meeting is but um yes we do have a q a at the end um and uh, we were going to just have people raise their hands and verbally say but in the meantime that, if that works too but if something occurs to people during your talk, then absolutely let them put it in the chat. All right. Okay. Then I'll begin. Uh, you probably already prayed, so I won't do that again. But I'm, I'm thankful today for the opportunity to be here and for the life that the Creator God gives me. And so I'm. Uh, I'm married for 43 years. I don't know if I said that in my thing. And I have four, four adult children and several grandchildren. My adult children, one lives in Montreal. He's doing a PhD in philosophy at McGill. And my, I have a daughter who lives close to me. She's a grade five teacher. I have another daughter who is still is living with us right now. And she's an aspiring artist. And my youngest son lives in Grand Prairie, Alberta. And he's married and he works in the oil industry there. I'm, uh, I'm uh, the doctrine of discovery. It refers to so. So what happens in in the new? In, we'll call it the new world. It was the new world to the Europeans. Everybody's familiar with uh, Chris. Chris Columbus gets lost, and indigenous people find him wandering around on the beach, and and then he says he discovered us. But uh, so then, 1492. Columbus enters the new world. This is earth shattering for the European worldview. The Europeans, so what happens is there's a guy by the name of uh, Bartolome de la Casas, is a Spanish, he's a, he's a youth in 1492, but his father sails with Christopher Columbus on his second voyage, the father of Bartolome de la Casas. And Bartolome de la Casas grows up and takes the journals of Christopher Columbus and then publishes them, writes them so that people all over Europe begin to read them. And I say it's earth shattering because for Europeans, finding indigenous people are, this is different than anything else they had ever experienced up to this point. They were familiar with Asian countries and they were familiar with African countries, but nothing like this. Indigenous people were completely different than anything they had ever experienced. And Bartolome de la Casas, when he publishes Columbus's journals and then you see so then if you if you read the 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 writings from those that period you see that it starts to show up in some of the writings there's a french writer montaigne he's writing and he begin he said he, they start to say things like how do we know that our way of looking at things is the right way to look at things it causes uncertainty in in Europe because they were so used to seeing things in a particular way. And here was a people who were not, didn't fit any of their categories. But of course, Spain is going through, has just, Spain has just defeated the Muslims in their territory. That had just happened just about the time that Columbus is going to the new world. So there's this, profundity of conquistadors, all these people who have been used to using violence to expel people from their territory. This is all important to understand how this happens in the, in the new world. So Chris Columbus discovers, even prior to this, just prior to this, the Portuguese are beginning to claim land in South America or in South, in Africa. And 
the church knows that certain things like slavery and taking people's territory, the church knows that it's not right. And the reason that they write papal bulls or the papal sort of the Pope writes these things that makes it legal to take land from people who are not Christian. Because in effect, what they do is they say that these people are declaring war on our Christian nation. So we have a right to take their land and to conquer them. That's the way that the papal bulls are ordered. And then when Christopher Columbus, they want to take, they want to take, well, it, it's two things. They're Christian, so they think that Bartolome de la Casas, right, this is an opportunity for an eternity, like an infinite number of souls could be brought into the Catholic Church. Hello. Everything is working good. This is what uh, Chris Columbus is writing in his journal. But the other thing he writes is about gold. You always, you can read that too. He's writing about the chance for the church to expand and an infinite number of souls to be added to the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And, but also gold, he's looking for gold. So the doctrine of discovery begins as this desire to legitimate or legalize the taking of land from indigenous people. And it happens by the Spanish first and the Pope writes two papal bulls that basically say, if these people won't respond to the gospel, if they won't receive Jesus, then in effect, we have the right to take their land because they're not Christian. And so that happens. And in South America, slavery is illegal. Slavery is illegal in the church, but if people, if you can prove that people are guilty of idolatry, and if you can prove they're guilty of, or if you can prove they're guilty of cannibalism, then as punishment, they can be made slaves. So that's kind of how the Catholic Church legitimates slavery. And so they write these papal bulls, they send all these conquistadors, but at first what they do is, they say they're not making slaves out of the indigenous people. They're making them, because they're going to pay them. So they, they, they take their land and then they organize them into these little communal farms or they're, they're sort of feudal farms. So they'll, be a, they'll appoint a Spanish ruler over them. And then the people are supposed to work for this ruler of their of their farm or their plantation and technically they're supposed to be paid but they're paid just a paltry sum just and not all of them receive their pay in this way in this way they can say that they're not they're not slaves because they're getting a wage but the wage is just so small and the land is forcibly taken other examples we can read about the writings in Bartolome de la Casas when he's in there, what they would do is go to an indigenous community. They would read in Spanish this decree that they have a half an hour or an hour or a limited number of time. They have a half hour or an hour or a day to respond to the gospel. So they'd read it to them in Spanish. Of course, none of the people could speak Spanish. And then they would say, if you don't respond in a positive way to receive the gospel and welcome these Spanish bringers of the gospel, these conquistadors, then we will destroy your village. So they wait a certain amount of time, and then they would destroy the village. They would kill them all, or as many as needed to. This is what happened in, in Cuba. They wiped out the indigenous people and then brought in from other countries black people to serve as servants or slaves in Cuba and in other countries, but they wiped out the indigenous people, killed them all, killed them all. Bartolome de la Casas actually, after a few years, realizes this is not right. He actually converts and, or he doesn't convert, but he becomes a Benedictine priest. I think it's been, he might've been Dominican. He becomes known as the defender of the Indians 
because he says we shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be doing this. But all the time, this battle is raging. There's two papal bulls that that happen, and uh, the church realizes that that's not right, and they actually begin to try to back up a little bit. There's a papal bull that comes out quite a while later, but eventually that says it's illegal to you cannot make slaves out of indigenous people and you cannot and they're allowed to be have private property that's how the papal bull says they're allowed to have pro private property the problem with this is this is all european standards private property is not a concept in indigenous peoples it's not that I sh it's 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 different i should say it's different for example, in North America, where I'm from, when the Europeans came into our territory and our treaty with the crown is in 1899, the teaching among the Cree is you can only possess what you can carry on your back. So how could you own the land? How could you own the land? It's silly because the land carries us. We don't carry the land. But Europeans had this idea of private property. It comes out of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, who are thinkers in Europe. Because of the discovery of the new world, and this, these doubts begin to happen, at the same time, the Reformation is starting to get going, and this whole new thinking about the way that civil society should be ordered is developing in England and in these French thinkers and a lot because of the discovery of the new world because everything the way that everyone looked at the world they thought they had this perfect picture of the world and indigenous people didn't fit into it so the church is trying to backpedal. The Catholic church is trying to backpedal. I say all this to say that there was never a doctrine of discovery that you could find in the, in, in the Catholic church that's labeled the doctrine of discovery. That, that doesn't exist. But what exists is these two, there's more than two, but at least two that sort of make legal the taking of indigenous land if it wasn't owned by Christians. And in the United States, for example, in the 1700s, they used that idea to take land. Thomas Jefferson says that the doctrine of discovery is international law, and it legitimates the United States from taking, but it shifts. The doctrine of discovery shifts to more a, what some in Latin is terra nullius, empty land the land's empty so we found it and it was empty so we're taking it so they plant flags that's happened in australia for example in australia they said that the land's empty so we just claimed it no one was using it no one was using it you have to understand also that the big thinkers in christian countries were thomas hobbes and John Locke, both of whom believe that Christianity, law and Christianity, nat natural law or the law of the land and Christianity were exactly the same. It's just that Christianity adds the part about needing a savior. But they just thought that Christianity, Thomas Hobbes writes that all other religions are superstition except Christianity. Christianity is the only one that's not superstition. So you see how Europeans have this thinking that everyone else is following these superstitions. We're the only ones who are following logical, reasonable religion, which is Christianity. And so then when, when newcomers come into North America, then they have this same idea that anything indigenous people have is less than 
what we have because everyone's religion is superstition except ours. It continues. Bartolome de la Casas is an interesting character because he actually shifts his whole thinking. He is a landowner because he's part of the Spanish and he's part of the elite Spanish because like I said, his father was on Christopher Columbus's second voyage. Bartolome de la Casas' first encounter with indigenous people, when he's about 12 years old, his father brings back some indigenous people from the new world back to Spain. And one of them becomes a companion to Bartolome de la Casas, sort of a servant to him. But they're, because la Casas is 12, 13 years old, they become more like companions. That seems to impact them because when de Casas travels to, to Cuba, and is given a farm or a, or a plantation. He has several indigenous people working for him, but he's very, he's more fair than most of the landowners. He is, he pays them more than what he's required. But eventually he realizes this is not right. This is not right. We shouldn't be doing this. So he starts to speak in defense of the indigenous people. And he actually gives up ownership to this land and he gives up all of his indigenous servants. But that takes him 10 years. The only reason I say that is that even when you realize something is wrong, sometimes it takes a while to work it through. So it takes him 10 years to actually give up all these slaves. And then he defends the indigenous people the best he can. He argues that Spain should let the indigenous people continue to occupy their territory. He even says that Spain should just, the Spanish should just go back to Spain and let the indigenous people, because by this time, many had received the gospel. He assumes that they would, if, if left, if we just left them to be servants of Spain, they could be in relation to the crown and we just left, they would just continue to be, they would be followers of Jesus and they would continue to be part of the church. He actually returns to Spain and that's where he passes away. But then they have this famous trial. The Span one person wants to continue to attack the indigenous people in Spain. And his argument is, as I said before, that they are guilty of idolatry and they are guilty of cannibalism. And because they are such awful people, they deserve to be slaves and they deserve to be conquered. That's, and, if, and the, the trial ends and it's not really, there's not really a decision, but that's, that continues to be newcomers, in South America and Central America, that's continue how they continue forward. They continue to believe that their culture is superior so that all other people should be brought into their culture. That continues in, uh, like I said, it, that, that idea shifts ever so slightly to be thinking of the doctrine of discovery or the empty land. And again, it's never an official doctrine of anybody except it's, it's quoted in a court case in the 1700s in, in the U.S., the Marshall decision. And he quotes papal bulls and the idea that the land is empty. And so then we created titles, so we have title. That's the idea. And that's the idea that happens in Canada. Canada has no legal standing to be in Canada other than it came here and exerted its authority. That's at least according to some scholars. In Canada, 1763, there's all this land grab going on. It's growing in people's minds that the land is empty. So all you have to do is go out on this land and claim it. And so that's what Europeans are doing. 1763, however, the Crown issues the Royal Proclamation. The Royal Proclamation says that no one has a right 
it does a couple of things. One, it recognizes that indigenous people have some kind of pre-existing title to land. And it mm-hmm. says that you, no one has a right to take or buy land from indigenous people, except the crown, except the crown. This is only honored, however, by, it ends up only being honored in Canada. But this royal proclamation is actually read in 1764 to about, I, th- I can't remember, it's a thousand or two thousand First Nations people. And they take it as a form of treaty, 1763. So then it becomes that the only way that Canada can become exist is if they make treaty with the First Nations people of Canada. So there's already one treaty, at least, the Haudenosaunee or the Six Nations. But at that point, there were five nations. Later, I think the Tuscarora joined to make it Six Nations. They signed the Two-Row Wampum Treaty with the Dutch, and then that's transferred to the to the, the English and the French who come. And it's the, I'm just learning some of this myself. I mean, because there's so much stuff you can learn. It's the two spoons, one bowl, too. It's the common bowl that the land is a gift and it sustains all who are upon it. And we were to live like the two row wampum is, it's a, it's a, it's a white, belt beaded belt and there's white beads and then there's two purple beads that go down two rows of ter- purple those signify that the newcomers and the Haudenosaunee are riding down the grand river in their canoes and they're nation to nation they're nation to nation not one being better than the other but nation to nation relations to this day in Canada, when the Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations, talk with the government, they put the two-row wampum belt on the table. The idea and that, so then Canada has to make treaty to have any right to be in the territory. But this doctrine of discovery or terra nullius continues to exist in newcomers minds and you see it popping up again and again for example sometimes treaties are just used because it's a way to placate the people the idea being that they're all going to die anyway so we'll just sign this but we're not going to keep it this was thinking in some people's minds not all of them. Douglas treaties on Vancouver Island, some of them were blank. They just told people to sign them and then they'll fill them in later. But in some places, treaty took on a different place. Uh, one interesting thing about treaty is John A. MacDonald. So Canada at that point, John A. MacDonald is the first prime minister. He wants to expand Canada past Ontario, but it doesn't, it doesn't go, technically it doesn't really go past Ontario. And so he sends, he sends troops through the United States to Manitoba because the Métis there have set up a provisional government in, in, Ontario, in Manitoba. So he sends troops or some people, not necessarily troops, from some officials down into the U.S., and then it's going to come up into Manitoba. But the Métis are all buffalo hunters, and they have guns, and they won't let these guys in, which John Johnny McDonald's is furious. He writes to England because there was some British troops stationed in Ontario, and he says uh, he wanted to make war on the Métis. Britain says, we're not making war on the Métis. You're going to have to make treaty. So they invite the Métis to Ottawa to make treaty. So that's how Canada extends into Manitoba, is they make a treaty with the Métis. 
The treaty to the Métis ensures three things. Number one, that French is an official language in Canada. I didn't know if you, I don't know if you knew that French is an official language in Canada because of the Métis, not just because of the Québécois, but because of the Métis. And then they also, part of the treaty was that Canada will always pay for Catholic schools. They will always pay for Roman Catholic schools because the Métis had accepted the gospel and they were Roman Catholic. And the third thing was there would be a million acres that would be distributed to the, to, to the descendants of the Métis, the Red River Métis, and that, that was never fulfilled. They've only, they only signed an agreement to how it will be fulfilled in 2018. The other treaties that existed in Canada, as, I, as it said, I think it said in my bio, were the were the the numbered treaties which part of Ontario I think Winnipeg's number one but part of Northern Ontario Saskatchewan and Alberta part of Northwest Territories part of Alberta was treaty eight all the way one to eleven there were the number treaties what was significant about these treaties were that they were indigenous treaties in their makeup more than they were European treaties. Commonwealth, they developed the idea, Commonwealth had this Commonwealth treaty. So, so Europeans weren't ignorant of treaties, but the treaty, the way that they ended up being formed and, and, and signed were indigenous treaties. They had indigenous qualities because they, they part, everybody did ceremonies. Christian ceremonies were done, but also indigenous ceremonies were done. And they made treaty and all the participants in the treaty believed that what they were doing was making a covenant. They were becoming like relatives and they were promising to live in the land like relatives. And they would exchange gifts symbolically and these treaties would be renewed every year some of the payments Canada realized or the crown realized that they could not afford to pay the indigenous people for their land. So they came up with the idea of a yearly annuity, a payment to be made every year. Their idea was that they would offer land to settlers, they would collect taxes from the settlers and from those taxes, they would pay a yearly annuity to the First Nations people, to the First Nations people. So this was how it was developing. There were also signs that these were indigenous treaties that and covenants, even the Henry Morris, who was the treaty commissioner, he would tell the First Nations that they were not like the Americans. The Americans signed treaty that had a limited number of years. They would be, they would sign them for 25 years or 100 years. Henry Morris says, said, what we are doing here today is we are, this treaty, so it's interesting and it was one of a European who said these words too. These treaties will last as long as the rivers run, as long as the grass grows. We are making a covenant here. In fact, he compares them to the United States. We are not like the United States who signs a 25 or a 50 year agreement. These treaties will last for all time. We are making a covenant. We are coming together. And the indigenous people thought these people, these newcomers were serious because they noticed that they stopped on Sunday to pray and to have a church service. In fact, many of the in Treaty 6, for example, many Indigenous people had already received the gospel at this point and asked that the treaty commissioners and the newcomers who were with them would send the priest over to their camp so that the priest could do a service with them as well. And they also offered the pipe to the newcomers and the, pipe, the newcomers received the pipe. They prayed with sweet grass which was part of the making relative ceremony. 
And at the end of it all, the treaty commissioner held the treaty up to the air, in the airs, and many of the indigenous people took it to mean that they were holding this up and offering it to God, and that they were becoming like relatives. So the the braid of sweet grass, we use sweet grass to pray sometimes. You take a bunch of grass and you put it in three bundles and you braid it into a braid. One of those group of grass, one of those strands of the braid that represents the newcomers. One strand represents the First Nations and Indigenous people and one strand represents the Creator and we promised that we would live like relatives and the Creator would hold us to it. In British Columbia, however, John A. Macdonald was worried he was worried that the Americans were going to take British Columbia because they were pushing up. So he, and he, so he starts building this railway across Canada. And he offers to the British Columbians the opportunity to join Canada. And he, and he tells them, if they, he kind of insinuates that they don't have to make treaty. They don't have to make treaty. So then... He, British Columbia resists making treaty the longest of all the provinces. They sign a treaty in 18, well, actually, some indigenous people in, in, in northern, northeastern BC in the Peace River country, they adhere to Treaty 8, which is signed in 1899. But the British Columbians the government of that day, they start to use that doctrine of terra nullius. They say, oh, the land's empty. The indigenous people here, they only occupy small places. We'll give them them small, we'll let them stay on those small places, but we're gonna claim all of this land. In the early 1900s, British Columbia actually tries to claim all crown land as provincial land. And that, that I think that's ruled unconstitutional at the time. But it's this idea that the land is empty. In many of the other countries, when they sign treaty, other uh, provinces, for every family of five indigenous people, they would receive 360 acres to live on. As it gets across the prairies, that number by the time it gets to British Columbia, I think, or uh, Alberta, it's reduced to about 180 acres for each family of five would receive, an, when they allotted land for reserves, would be about 160 acres. In British Columbia, they only gave 10 to 15 acres for reserves because they said, oh, these people are just little groups of people. And they refused to make treaty with most of the indigenous people in Canada. They refuse. Wilfrid Laurier actually tells British Columbia the, the parliament there. There is no way you're going to get around this. There is no legal way to get around not making treaty. You're going to have to make treaty. You've got to. You have to. Even early on in the late, in, in late 1800s, the Niska, who lived on the northern part of just below the Alaska panhandle, they travel all the way down to the British Columbian legislature late 1800s to make treaty they've heard about the royal proclamation in 1763 and they go to make treaty the then premier of british columbia refuses to even let them into the provincial legislature he refuses to talk to them this all changes in the 70s there's a historic case called the calder case and the calder case said you have to you basically, that indigenous people have title to land. And uh, suddenly British Columbia has to make treaty. The Niska show up and they want to treaty and eventually sign it. In 1999, the Niska Treaty is signed. And this is all a recognition that the land is not empty. The land had indigenous people there. So they... The treaty affirms four things. Most indigenous people affirm four things. Number one, that all peoples should have the privilege of a peaceful existence. 
Number two, that all peoples should have access to the land. That means to be able to live in a relationship. Number three, that all people should be able to live off the bounty of Mother Earth. Number four, that all peoples should be able to be who they were created to be. That's the treaty. The treaty, I talk about it so much that you, so you understand the treaty actually made room for newcomers because we understand that the creator has made everyone, and there's a certain dignity that everyone has because they are made by the creator and they were brought there. And the treaties are the only legal, they're the only real uh, reason that Canada can exist. Canada exists because it made treaty with Indigenous people. Canada exists because of the goodwill of Indigenous people, not the crazy idea that Europeans had that the land was empty. That's not why Canada and countries exist. It's because the goodwill of Indigenous people who understood the grace of the Creator, who gave land as a gift and what we are supposed to live in harmony with. People want people to renounce the doctrine of discovery and all of those all of those practices that came with it it's a symbolic gesture it's like when you do a land acknowledgement to acknowledge that someone was here before that the creator doesn't make a mistake by putting them there and that we're trying to live in wholeness in harmony with one another that's why they asked for the renunciation of the doctrine of discovery and to unravel all these different ideas that somehow legitimated one people looking down on another people as being superstitious, of needing to be civilized, of not having any understanding of things like law. Our law told us that we are to strive to live in harmony with all people and with all things. We can see it all around us. And so then that's my understanding of the doctrine of discovery. And I've been talking for a long time now. And so if you have any questions, this would be a good time. Thank you, Ray, very much. Uh, you're a storyteller. It's wonderful. Um, I, I, what, what we had thought was, because our group is not huge, that we could, instead of writing uh, questions in the chat, although you're still free to do that, if you um, just raise your hand, but because we can't see everybody all at once, I'm just, some of you already know this, but if you look at the bottom of your screen where it says reactions, you see the icons along the bottom? If you click on that, you'll see one that says raise hand. And so when you click on raise hand, then your square on the, on the grid here goes to the top. And then I can tell that you're asking a question. So if anybody has never done this before, this is take 15 seconds. Oh, take, 15. take 15 seconds to practice. If you've never done it before, just click it to raise your hand and then click it again to put your hand down. Um, and, then, and then we'll at, enter into a dialogue here with Ray. Um, so while you're working on that and while you're thinking of your question, I have a question for you, Ray. Um, I was going to, I was going to ask, you know, about the effect of this kind of European su superiority thinking that's behind what we call the doctrine of discovery, how that, in your view, how that has affected the church, but you kind of touched on that. What, if you've got more to say about that, that would be helpful. But there are many Indigenous people who identify as Christian. Yeah. Um, and I'm actually, I have a Baptist history, but I'm currently Anglican. So I'm aware of 
very aware of the um, movement to creating an indigenous, an uh, autonomous indigenous church within the Anglican Church of Canada. So I'm really interested in, in what, in your thinking and experience, what the church would look like if indigenous spirituality and indigenous theology was truly a part of the life of the church. Right. Uh, I think that, yeah, so at the heart of racism, at the heart of all racism is one people looking down at another people and seeing them as having nothing to offer. So the problem, the problem in Canada has been that, that and, it, and it infected the church is that Christians thought people outside of the church did not have anything to offer. That and then indigenous people had nothing to offer because they weren't Christian. So then they were a problem to be solved. This shows up in the Canadian government as the Canadian government. So they understand that we're supposed to be nation to nation when they start. But early on, they pass a document called the, the, uh, the Indian Act. The Indian Act is, becomes law in Canada to legalize what was before illegal activity by the Canadian government. That's how they could legally take children from their parents for the residential school. They passed a law called the Indian Act that made Indians wards of the Canadian state. So they said we were like children. And so then they, in Canada, that's why the Indigenous people could not vote until 1960, because they weren't legal citizens. They weren't even, in one sense, weren't human beings until that point. And the only way that they could have the right to vote and be a citizen in Canada is if they stopped being Indigenous and became enfranchised which happened to my grandfather. And when he joined the Canadian army, he was enfranchised, but he lost his treaty status. So then anytime a people look at another people as having looked down on them, they do two things. One, they either become paternalistic because they think that they have to parent these other people because they're just, you know, they're like children. They don't understand what to do. And, and often it's, you can tell if you have this view of people, if you think this other people is a problem to be solved. If you can only see another people as a problem to be solved, then you're probably paternalistic. And if you also look at another people as having nothing to offer you, but you have something to offer them, then you're probably paternalistic. And the problem with paternalism, it's on the same continuum as racism. Racism is just more advert. Then you begin to use your economic and social power to maintain an imbalance. And that happened particularly in the United States with the Jim Crow laws, particularly in South Africa with apartheid, which, which they model after Canada. That's how apartheid comes into place. They model it after the Canadian reservation system. And, and the Jewish Holocaust, that's, that's when, you know, they, they, that's when a, they becomes full-blown racist regime. I don't know that Canada ever became a full-blown racist re regime, but these ideas are there. In the indigenous church, what's happening is we're just trying to be open to that. There's always a group. It's never just... You know, people always have a group. There's always a group of people. It's never, and we should have group to group relationships. We're a regional kind of place in Canada. Every, every province has its certain ways of doing things. That part the land has taught us. And as long as in Canada, we understand the regional differences means that, you know, we do things slightly different ways in different places. This is the idea of nation to nation, that we have our different groups. For indigenous people, the idea of nation is all my relatives. And then your, your group and other groups should work to be in harmony because oftentimes we share the same territory. 
That's the idea that indigenous people have about the indigenous church, the Anglican church, for example. They don't want to not be Anglican, but they want to have a significant stay, say in how they order their church in their communities and using their language and their songs and what they understand about spiritual practices. This is just something that's afforded to all peoples everywhere. Instead of trying to force people into a particular way of doing things. That's, so it's, it's seeking to be in harmony. This is different than, for example, the, the, the idea of separation. That's not what Indigenous people are thinking. They're thinking like treaty, nation-to-nation -nation relationship. That's what they're thinking about. So there is a long answer to a probably simpler question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it has just been pointed out to me that we were supposed to have a stretch break before the Q&A. Um, okay. But we, here we are in the Q&A. So what can I just say to people, if you need to go away for a minute to look after your physical needs, get a drink, whatever, go to the bathroom, um, please just feel free to do that. Um, and then I think we'll just continue rather than because we're kind of got the momentum going here if that's okay uh does anybody have a strong objection to that okay hearing nothing <laughs> deborah you you have your hand up i do um ray this question isn't really about the doctrine of discovery it's a bit more personal a question um i hope it's okay but you i know you talk about your story so i just wanted to say to you uh i'm from i'm a descendant of settlers uh who were in the area of uh the rice lake treaty and i'm watching you giving this presentation and you're smiling as you're talking about it now i think that if i was talking about it I'd be angry and I would, I would, I can't imagine that I'd be smiling. So, and I can't imagine that I would still be in the church and a part of the church. I just wonder if you could comment on that. Uh, well, yeah, there's two things. One, there's a practice among some indigenous people, more on the Northern Plains. They're called sacred clowns and they'll show up during funerals because it hurts so bad. You just need to laugh sometimes because it hurts too much. Another one is from, there's actually a, if you're interested in the Niska Treaty, you used to be able to watch it on YouTube. It was called Dancing in Two Worlds. It's a 20 minute sort of little documentary on the Niska Treaty, which was signed in 1999. I think it's, we Googled Niska Treaty in YouTube, dancing in two worlds or both worlds. But in there, there's a lawyer who says, you know, the more intense the situation, the more the Niska would laugh and tell jokes. And mm. Because it's hurting so much, you gotta, you gotta sometimes remember and not take yourself so seriously. Mm. Third, then third, I think I, part of my healing is you begin to develop empathy and realize that there's reasons why people do what they do, good reasons and bad reasons. I'm not, and I'm not legitimate any, any of the really bad stuff. There's no good reason for a residential school. There's no good reason. But some of these things, we're trying to work through them. And I want to be approachable to people. If I, I could try to be angry and stuff, but I, I'm, there's a limited return to that. Mm -hmm. I could, I could try to make people feel guilty, but I just think that there's a limited return to that. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to present a face that people, we could begin to have a conversation. There's three movements in restorative justice. One is you got to tell the truth. 
to you got to listen. I just found if I'm if I'm smiling a little bit or showing that I really do care, mm -hmm. that that could help people to listen. And if they listen, then we could come up with a shared plan about how to fix the damage. So thank you. Thank you. That's kind of high. You bet. Thanks, Deborah. There's a question in the chat. Everybody could take a look at it, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. But the question is about what about the removal of statues of people who have a, a history of um, racism or people associated with residential school, the founding of residential schools. We've all read about these these stories in the news, very recent. And the question is really does does the removal of statues like this change anything? Is there anything worthwhile about doing that? Uh, probably to the people who removed the statue. I think that they're trying to do it as a, they're trying to do something to help people to heal. I think the thing with McGill, if I remember correctly, he's involved in the slave trade. I think that's, or owning slaves. I think that's probably part of the thing. And that was really bad. I think probably another way that you could do these things is just to say another way you could do it, which also would have significance and might help people is if you, if you had both said the good, the positive things they did and the negative things, you know, just have them both. Right. Johnny McDonald was a significant leader in Canada. He was first prime minister. But he did some bad things. You should just have both things there when you put a statue up. I think that, yeah, that's always my concern too, that if you have you really done anything, what I want people to do and not, you can, you can take, take down statues. Okay, I think some streets should be renamed in Canada. They should. Like for example, in Regina, Saskatchewan, Dudney. Dudney. Dudney was a terrible person. He was a terrible person. He set out to drive the indigenous people in Saskatchewan into poverty so that they could be better controlled by the government. He was a terrible human being. They shouldn't name a, uh, they shouldn't name a street after him. That's just infuriating. And so it is good to take it down because, because every time you see it, you're just, you're just, sort of telling people to their face who know that history that, oh, it doesn't matter. They did good things. That makes it okay. It doesn't make it okay. It doesn't make it okay. But part of this healing process is to just, and the bigger thing would be just to have a conversation. How should we do this? You know, sometimes taking a statue down can cause some healing to come. Or maybe you write, what both did. I'll give you another example. There's a missionary, first missionary in Western Canada, the Anglican Church. John, oh, the name is going to come to me. Anyways, he, at the, he, he actually arranges for two orphans, might have been three, to get some education. Indigenous kids who are orphans, he arranges to have them have education. One of those becomes Henry Budd. Henry Budd, Henry Budd baptizes thousands of Indigenous people. He, he becomes one of the first priests, Indigenous priests in, 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 uh, in uh, Canada, and he spreads the gospel to thousands of Indigenous people in, in northern Manitoba. And so, yeah, John West, that's his name. So John West is key. In, and there's another one too, I think James City. He spreads the gospel all over Saskatchewan. So that's a good, good thing that John West does. But at the same time, he advocates beating children to get them to go to residential school, which is a terrible thing. So Indigenous people have this ability to hold both things. They're bad things and good things. So, do they think that John West was a good person? Yeah, sometimes he was. Was he a bad person? Yeah, sometimes he was. So, I think we need to nuance things this way. 
because it helps us be more realistic and it helps us to understand that we're broken and we're trying to figure this out. If we come together and work through and try to come up with a plan to resolve things, it's never going to make everybody happy. But that's kind of how I think about it. Thank you. Gary Caldwell, you have your virtual hand up. You're, you're, you're muted. muted. You're muted, Gary. Thank you. Ray, you, 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 in your last uh, sentence, you sort of addressed part of my question. Uh, I thank you for, I thank you for your smile because that's much more fetching than uh, some of the uh, some of the presentations we see on, on the issue. Uh, we are where we are. How do we get towards where we should be? Yeah, good question. My philosophy is, uh, has been, like I said, restorative justice has with the idea that you, uh, restorative justice, by the way, is an attempt at reconciliation. It's an right. attempt at reconciliation. And, and what it involves is you got to tell the truth. And I think in Canada, the right thing that we've been doing is we set up ways for people to tell the truth. So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that happened in Canada was a good thing because we were telling the truth. Any kind of media presentation or a well-done documentary or well-written book that tells the truth, that's a positive thing. So any way that we can tell the truth and number two, that you can listen, that you can really listen, but you got to listen with your heart, which requires training because people don't always do it well. And it's not just hearing the words and as people are talking, listening, how you're going to respond, but it's about listening and really hearing what people are saying and feeling and feeling. So when Indigenous people tell their story and it's painful, it really does help if non-Indigenous people listen and feel the pain that some newcomers caused. Because if you feel that pain, that gives you emotional resources to actually begin to change and begin to think through how to change the situation. But it needs more than just anger. Anger is too easy to be destructive. You need anger to be spoken to by reason. I don't think you should lose your anger. You should feel that. But then you should speak to it with some reason and get a vision of what you think we should be. Like in Canada, I think we should be casting a vision for a unity that is big enough to have a, a healthy dialogue about things, but in overall committed to moving forward in unity, but not polarized and saying this group is good and this group is evil, but that we have, we're trying to move together and we're trying to provide a place for our children and our grandchildren that they can experience love, peace, relationship to land, and be able to live in a good way with enough to eat, a place that they can live, that, that those things are the treaty, that we should create a dialogue and a picture of unity that works towards that. So we should tell the truth, really listen, come up with a shared plan. And I think that's what we're doing. We're trying to come up with a shared plan. <laughs> Excuse me, but it takes time. That's why... The enemies of these things are cynicism, resentment, um, greed. You know, all those things are enemies to that. So we have to, I think that's where we, the gift of the church is we can. <clears throat> Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote that the spirit is not only the mediator between God and people, but is the mediator between people and people. So I just think that's what we should be pushing towards. So. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Thank you. Heather Hobbs, you have your hand up. Am I unmuted? Yes. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ray, for your presentation, which was a bit disrupted on my part because I had the bellman here who kept turning off my Wi-Fi. So anyways, uh, I'm back now. But um, I just wanted to run something by you. And I, I don't know whether to look for an answer from you, but I'd love some comment. Um, tomorrow, our Baptist congregation is celebrating its 92nd anniversary. Um, we haven't always been in the same building. We, we purchased our building from the Presbyterians in the, in the sort of village area who fell out with each other and the person holding the mortgage sold to the Baptists. So I think we've been in our building for about um, 80 years, something like that. And we are now in discussions within our congregation with how to move forward, given that our congregation is definitely dwindling. And uh, we want to make sure that we are doing the right thing by the history of our congregation and by our, um, and, and leaving some kind of legacy in our community while trying to sustain our worship in, the, in, in, our, in our building or somewhere nearby. Um, at the same time, every Sunday, in the, at the outset of our service, we, we read uh, our land acknowledgement about um, the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee who, who were before us in the land. And so it was raised in our planning group. So how do we bring those together? How do we connect with, with our um, indigenous community? Uh, as we go through this process. Hmm. I've, I've heard of a couple, with... yeah, yeah. Okay. I've heard of a couple things I've heard of, but I, you'd have to check them out because I might not get them right. They're annex anecdotal. So I know I, I've heard of churches who, but they're, they're close to indigenous land or they're on indigenous, they, they acknowledge they're on indigenous land. So they have it written into their constitution. But should they ever cease to exist as a religious organization, they would try to continue to sell it to another religious organization. But should that place ever cease to be used for a church or a religious meeting place, that it would revert to the traditional indigenous people who had occupied that place. So that's, that's what would happen. I've heard of other places who Along with that, also give a ceremonial $1 lease payment every year to the local Indigenous group, just to acknowledge that they are the traditional stewards of that territory. There's also examples of private owners. There's a group, these are private, I think they're business people. They've given land back to Indigenous groups, both on the East Coast and now on Vancouver Island on the West Coast. They just give it back. When they pass, they just leave it to the indigenous group. So that's that's one way you could think about doing it. I've heard. I don't know if that helps, but that's how I think. Thank you. You bet. Thank you, uh, Fred Demare. You have a question. It isn't so much a question as a comment that that something Ray said raised in my, my mind, uh, particularly around the business of statues and so on. Recently, Edgerton Ryerson's statue was removed from Ryerson University and the name of the university changed. And that, I understand that. I don't, I, and I think probably that was the right thing to do as far as the naming of the university, but I think we have to be careful, and I like what you were saying about nuancing the differences, to remember that we would not have our system of public education in anywhere in Canada if it hadn't been for Edgerton Ryerson and behind the scenes with him, a Baptist, Robert Fife, who really pushed for, uh, for education that was for everybody and not just for the, uh, uh, the, the Anglican elite. Uh, which was the way it was was shaping up to be if it hadn't been for that. And 
So there is the both the good and the bad because he was part of the architect for the uh, uh, the residential schools and uh, therefore uh, a bad thing that um, uh, that the uh, uh, that 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 it happened. So uh, so I I I just saw that as an example of what you were saying earlier that yeah. that's something yeah. we're just learning. Because most of us didn't even know that Edgerton and Ryerson had uh, uh, was the architect of the or of the prime architect of the residential school system. We just yep. knew of him as the great educator for Ontario. Yeah, the other flood. Yeah, yeah. Flood Davin is the other guy who wrote a report for Johnny McDonald. Flood Davin went and toured the. Res industrial schools in the United States, which also is a good lesson. Why does Canada always use failed policies in the United States? Like, why do we always do that? Like, just stop, stop. They didn't work there. They're not going to work here. So that's what I think about. <laughs> that's a, another good question. Um, uh, Bob and or Lynn Bond have a question in the chat, which is one that will be, it could probably keep us going for the rest of the day. Can there be reconciliation with settlers maintaining ownership of the land that's been taken? Well, I think that ownership is, like, it's not like you're going to suddenly, it's, it's, that's not going to happen. The Indigenous people aren't going to suddenly take ownership away from, from non-Indigenous people. That's, that's not going to happen. I think, though, that, the rely, you know, that's a big pro. that's a thing that happens, though is it is scary it is scary if you think about the reconciliation that happened between joseph and his brothers if you remember the story joseph is sold into bondage by his brothers and years later they end up in egypt and he recognizes them and he has become strong and he's a he's a ruler and he recognizes them. And then it starts this process of reconciliation. And at one point, they're terrified when he tells them that he's their brother. They're terrified because they think of all the things that we have done. He is going to do the same thing to us. And they're scared. And he says, no, no. What you meant for bad somehow god has still brought about good and we and they reconcile that's the spirit that indigenous people have that's what's handed down to us from our relatives that's why the indigenous people were the ones who asked for reconciliation not canada not the church the as part of the agreement the residential school settlement to the survivors of the residential school, the survivors asked for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to seek for reconciliation. And they asked that it be paid for out of the final settlement. So the survivors of the, the residential schools are the ones who asked for reconciliation and asked and paid for it, not Canada. Canada and the church did not ask for it or pay for it. Indigenous people did because they know unless you seek the harmony and peace of the land, no one can live in the land for long, for the land will spit you out. That's what the Creator says to Israelites. If you need to remember that you were all sojourners, you were all wandering. You're all, you're all guests. We're all guests on the earth. Because after we're dead and gone, the land will still be here and we'll be gone. So that's how I think about it. So then where it comes to sharper focus in, you know, in the United States, and that's some of the, the, some of the, some of the fake news that happens down there is that somehow there's this big, uh, there's an attempt to replace people with another people, you know, so that's, so that's kind of how the right, some of the people, some of the people say, oh yeah, all these immigrants are just here to replace us. You know, that's, that's not, 
that sort of thinking isn't. I know why people get scared like that, but it's not. That's not living in the house of love, living in the house of love. John 15, Jesus said, the world wants you to live in a house of fear. Jesus said, why don't you live in the house of love instead? So that's kind of how I think about it. It's a good land. We live in a good land. It's a big land. There's room for everybody. And we'll continue to make peace and figure it out. I have other examples, but I'll start to stop. Thank you. Thank you. That, that, that's very Christian theology we're hearing here. Uh, Susan and John, I don't, I, I, you have a question. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Your, your demeanor and approach to the topic is um, disarming and refreshing and uh, hopeful is what it is. So I appreciate that so much. My question is, I wonder if you see in your um, expert, with your expert eyes, ex remnants or existence where, where population is still thinking in the, this dominant doctrine of discovery mindset, whether it be regarding land or whether it be regarding any, any other power process, or do we still think that way or have, have we managed to sort of not think that way anymore? Uh, yeah, we still think like, yeah, it's sad. Still think that way, but there are examples of some political processes. I'll give you some examples in the past of times when we lapsed into that. Uh, and I'll give you also examples of times that were, were, I'll give you two examples. And one is when that we did make significant dif a difference. I'll try to be nonpartisan. I'll try to find good examples for all political parties to, in this. So then, uh, uh, maybe you don't like liberals, but uh, the, the government of Paul Martin, Paul Martin did more to further the whole movement towards reconciliation than, I don't know, of a lot of significant, a lot of politicians. Paul Martin did a lot. He managed to, it never, but the sad thing, it never came into, he, he brokered this Kelowna Accord. And it was going to, it really had brought all the players to the table about education. Well, that was a big chunk of that. Indigenous, non-Indigenous, and it was, it was really a good approach to things. So that's a good example. The bad example was the Conservative Party used the Kelowna Accord as a wedge issue and said, to voters, oh, vote for us. We're not gonna, we won't let them do this Cologne Accord. It's gonna cost too much money. So then, but at the same time, when Stephen Harper was in power, he issues an apology. It's, it's a conservative government that issues the apology, which is fitting because it's a conservative government that institutes the residential schools. So then, it's a fitting thing to happen and it does further healing in Canada. So those are two examples where politicians do some, some good things. And when it comes to the church, the church should hold all of its truths lightly, understanding that the way we think about these things is always limited in how we view them. And, uh, there's still a tendency in some church groups to think that they have the corner on the market of truth and that the only way they, the way they see it is the only right way to see it. And there are other ways to see things. I know that's truth has fuzzy edges. So then just remember that. Just remember that. That's, those are examples. So I just, that's what I think about. I, anyways, that's what I thought about. I hope that helps. Truth has fuzzy edges. Love yeah. it. Love it. Blake, Edie, you have a question or a comment. Yeah, uh, my question actually kind of got answered in some of um, your illustrations. And I want to thank you for your examples. And I, I'm sitting here listening to this whole thing. 
And I wish you, I, I could listen to you for another hour or two hours. Uh, I just want to say amen, amen, and amen. So thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you, Blake. Deborah, you have a question. I do, and uh, I definitely concur with Blake. Thank you very, and Ray, thank you very, very much. Um, when we kind of responding to Susan's um, uh, question of today, I work in the child welfare system, which is a system that continues um, to not manage uh, equity seeking groups in a very positive way. Um, in the, the corner of the world where I live, we have an Indigenous team um, that uh, works with the uh, Mississaugas of the Credit, um, as well as other uh, children in care from other um, bands. Um, and we have instituted um, not, so I manage the resource department, which is the foster parents. Um, and we have instituted in, in a response to how we can change things for today, that foster parents, regard, regardless of their religious um, uh, affiliations, cannot take children in care that are placed in their homes to any place of worship um, unless the biological parents sign a consent that they can do so. And that the child themselves is open to that. Um, so it has created a lot of pushback because most of our foster homes come out of the church, um, definitely out of an evangelical um, church, um, but is the way that we feel that we can move forward and changing um, the child welfare perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I think you can work with that. I don't know. I think if you're open, I think you can work with that and understand why that, why that would be. I mean, it doesn't say that you can't read Bible stories at home or pray or it's just, I remember when I took an evangelism course that even when you, when you read, when you lead someone to Christ, uh, you know, you should, you should guard them when you take them to church because sometimes some well-meaning people say some pretty hurtful things. So you should. You should be the go-between that explains what's going on because not everybody knows what's going on and it can be traumatizing sometimes. So then, yeah, that makes sense to me. It makes sense to me. And why wouldn't you want the parents to sort of get on board? It also is a better understanding. You got to think about, I think God's intention is to draw all people to himself. I think that's God's intention. I think that's God's intention that we should, there should be a unity of all humanity that we should somehow feel connected to one another, a solidarity. But I think it's also God's intention that would manifest itself in a variety of ways. But we ought not to condemn one another. And anytime that we can promote talking to one another and explaining things, then we should do that. So I just think that this is just what you and your team are doing is try to seek a good conversation and so that everyone knows exactly what's going on. So don't we, so we don't repeat some things in the past. I just think that's a good idea. And I think that if we, my dad used to say to me, he said, look, and my dad and one of my mentors, he said, I just assume everybody's committed. That's how I function in life. And that's how I, so I, that's how I function. I just, function, I just assume everybody's committed and want to work towards healing and producing something good. I just assume that. And that's how I function. And that's how I function in ministry. I don't spend a lot of time preaching to people about commitment. I just assume they're committed. They can tell me if they want that they're not committed. That, but that's up to them. That's not my, it's not my job to judge them whether they are or not. I just assume they are. That's how I treat young people too. I just assume they're committed. And I treat them like, I treat them in a respectful manner. And we try to do something together. I'm, uh, 
I'm, I'm needing to give up this office that I borrowed pretty quick. I hope that's okay. I don't know what your time period is like there, but. Well, and on our schedule, we have another 10 minutes or so. Oh, that'll work. That'll work. I can do 10 sure? more minutes. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. How All about right. two more questions? Two more questions. Okay. Good enough. I um, I can come up with a question, but I'm going to okay. give somebody else a chance if... Um... Oh, Gary. Okay. Fully respect what you said, uh, Ray, about uh, working together and listening and uh, uh, trying to find the harmony. Uh, is there any point in addressing the Indian Act early as part of the way forward, in your opinion? I, it wasn't, you know, I, the Indian Act, uh, I don't know as much about it as I probably should, but what's, what's the most important thing in the whole thing is that when the government did try to do something, you probably remember the white paper that John Chrétien delivered under Pierre Elliott Trudeau's government. The white paper in the 1970s was going to do away with the Indian Act. The problem was they didn't actually talk to any Indigenous people. They just decided to do it. And the problem was that they were also going to wipe out many of the treaty benefits or the, tree, the things of the treaty in doing it. They thought they were claiming they were doing something that was going to equalize people or do away with some racism, but they really didn't think it through. So the lesson that I have from that, and incidentally, that uh, many of the things in the white paper actually come out of the government, the way they were policies in Tommy Douglas's government. And, and, and then the white paper, and then Brian Mulroney resurrects those things in his government. And then, and then Stephen Harper resurrects more of them in in, uh, in his government. And the problem is, is they don't acknowledge that Indigenous people are nations of people. Nations of people. They want to reduce Indigenous people to single individuals, just a lot of single individuals. And they're not acknowledging the group identity of Indigenous peoples. So when you're doing away with the Indian Act, you need to involve indigenous people in it. And that would be a way forward. So, and that's what the Canadian government has resisted many times. Because to let someone else help you do something and you're the government, that is difficult because you want to be in control. One more question. Okay, Cindy, you have your hand up. And you're muted. Oh, yeah, Cindy, you're muted. No, nope, I guess Cindy's not there. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Yep. It's the removal of... Uh, is the removal of, of, of statues and or changing the name of the streets, is that going to do, is that, is that, is that going to do anything? Does that actually give, give, give any healing? You know. Does that change anything? I think the American Civil Rights Movement changed some things and it was some passive. I think as long as you don't get violent, I don't agree with violence, but it does change things if you are, uh, non nonviolent, but you are forcing the issue. You're forcing a decision to be made. I think it does. I think it does change things. And there's yeah. numerous examples of that. The civil rights movement, the taking back of India from Britain by the Indian people, the things that made the biggest impact were the nonviolent protests. But when it gets violent, I don't agree with that. I don't, I don't agree with the revolutions I, like that are violent. I don't agree with that. I don't think that's right at all. It may have been uh, Rosa, Rosa Parks in, in, in the States who, who started the, uh, the Americans' uh, civil rights when she, when she refused to, uh, get, to give up her seat to, to, on the bus yep. to, to a white guy. 
and that bus yep. is, is, is now, I think, in 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 a museum. Yep. So, yeah, folks, yeah. I have to, I have to, I gotta say thank you. I gotta thank you and say goodbye, and I okay. hope you have a good rest of your day. Very, very good. Uh, ch 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 uh, ch oh, Cindy, Cindy, excuse me. Larry, Larry is just gonna say a couple of words of thanks, Ray. All right. When he unmutes. You muted, Larry. Okay. Well, Ray, you pointed out that the uh, papal bulls were uh, very much uh, used to justify the uh, legal and moral justification for dispossessing indigenous people of their lands. It's interesting that the TRC's uh, final report uh, rest, notes that the doctrine uh, rests upon the belief that the colonizers were bringing civilization to savage peoples. <laughs> and uh, who would never civilize themselves, which uh, of course lies behind the whole residential school uh, movement and its legacy, which comes to us today. Uh, it the TRC calls upon the um, parties of the Indian residential school settlement to uh, sign uh, covenants of reconciliation. And I guess those uh, groups where uh, mostly the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, and the United Churches. Uh, but Action 49 calls upon all religious denominations, and that includes us, uh, to uh, repudiate these concepts of um, superiority. And so uh, I would just say thanks very much for your Excellent presentation and for answering all our questions. Thanks again. Take care, folks. See ya. Thanks so much, Ray. Bye bye. Thank you, Ray. Bye bye. bye, -bye. All right. Uh, we're supposed to start our annual meeting at three. So, how about we take a, a 10 minute break? And we didn't get our break before, but. Uh, and then we'll start the, the meeting rate right at three o'clock.